me to Ecclesiastes chapter 2. Not a normal Hosanna City uh, opening, but I want to say, welcome to Ecclesiastes. <laughs> Our new series that we are calling Under the Sun as the writer, the preacher of the book of Ecclesiastes is getting us to a place to where we allow our hearts to ask the tough questions of life. Matter of fact, that is the wonderful thing about the book of Ecclesiastes. It asks the tough questions regarding the meaning of life. Matter of fact, the horrible thing about the book of Ecclesiastes is it asks the tough questions about the meaning of life. We began last week at our journey of Ecclesiastes as we saw this, this guy that he, he calls the preacher. Maybe it's Solomon himself writing about his life, and I, I think that might be what we see today. Or, or if it's this character that he's writing about uh, in the book of Ecclesiastes as he's making his way through to say, hey, I want to help my audience, us, uh, those that are believers, even those that are non-believers, to as we read through this book, which seems at times so difficult and so depressing, can I get an amen? amen. Uh, it has meaning. And it has meaning because what it does is it takes everything that's under the sun and it declares it as meaningless. Matter of fact, it gives us two key words. These two key words we find all throughout the book of Ecclesiastes, which become the keys to unlocking the door of interpretation as to why the writer writes this book and why it reads the way it does. It, 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 these two key phrases are the phrase under the sun, which means everything that's underneath this sun in real life, this kingdom that we live for, this world that we live in today. Day, and secondly, the word meaningless. Matter of fact, what happens is the book of Ecclesiastes, it actually reveals to us, the book of Ecclesiastes real, reveals to us what life is when God does not reveal to us what life is. This is a book that is for the agnostic. This is a book that is for the atheist. Or this is a book for the believers that have a hard time seeing what benefit there is above the sun. Because if we live for this world and things that are under the sun, and God does not reveal to us that life is all about the things that are above the sun, then what do we find? We find meaningless. And throughout the entire book of Ecclesiastes, the preacher uses this word, hevel, this word that basically means emptiness or a vapor. It's this idea of like smoke, it goes out and appears for a second. It appears to have substance, but changes and shifts. And as soon as it is, is as soon as it isn't. As soon as it appears is as quickly as it disappears. That it's impossible to grasp or to grab. It appears for a second to have substance, but as soon as it's present and as soon as it is even reach for, to grab hold of, is as quickly as it dissipates. And the truth is, if we are honest with ourselves, with the tough questions of life, matter of fact, if we're honest with ourselves today, we could say that the things that we once lived for, that we found so much meaning in, that brought our heart so much delight, have changed over time. The things we were obsessed with when we were 12 are not the things that we were obsessed with at 22 or at 42 or at 62. It could be something as simple as a hobby or, a val or something that is a value or a relationship. But listen, the first thing to hit our minds when we go to bed at night, that thing that we're obsessing over, it's not the same thing or the first thing that hit our minds when we put our head on our pillow five years ago and for many of us even six months ago. If you think about it, what obsesses you today hasn't always obsessed you because our hearts have a way of constantly searching for something new. Why? It's because there is not a single thing under the sun that brings ultimate satisfaction. And it's precisely what the preacher is going to address today. The meaninglessness, the hevel, the, the, the vapor of smoke, the grasping for the wind of living for keyword pleasure. 
He states here in verse one as he opens the tough question he's going to wrestle with today. Is there meaning and purpose in living for whatever it is that your heart desires? I said in my heart, which means to my own self, to my own soul, I'm going to test, I'm going to take a journey. I'm gonna begin a process of discovering something. What is he going to test? I will test you, heart, I will test you, life, with mirth. Now, none of you probably know what the word mirth means unless you're at first service. And we have a tendency as Christians to when we don't know a word, just say, I guess that verse doesn't apply to me, let's move on. That's not the case. The word mirth simply means pleasure. It means to consume yourself with seeking after yourself and living for yourself to please the sensual nature of your flesh. The, the preacher here is saying, come now, I told myself, I'm going to try something new. I'm going to begin a quest of living for mirth or living after the fulfillment of sensual desires or basically, I'm going to do whatever in the world I want to do. Therefore, he tells himself, enjoy pleasure. But surely this also was what? That this is meaningless. This is the Hebrew word that we've been talking about, hebel. This is, this is meaningless. I, I, I told myself, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to live for self. In conclusion, he says, it was meaningless. And then he continues his process of how he came to that conclusion. This is what we would call in, in the English uh, language, hedonism. It, take note on the back of your bulletin today that hedonism is the pursuit of pleasure. Uh, can everybody say pleasure with me today? Pleasure. Hedonism is the pursuit, the constant pursuit of pleasure through sensual or self-indulgence. It's the seeking after and the living after the five senses and the things that it would bring in a momentary happiness and pursuit of self. No doubt the preacher in this text lived a hedonistic lifestyle. Matter of fact, he comes to this conclusion as he says by his own admission that he refused himself no pleasure. The key evidence to this is actually found in the word self. He actually uses in 11 short verses the words I, me, and myself 36 times. No wonder he was so miserable because he made it all about him. Now, at first glance, you might be thinking the writer must be only addressing living after sinful behavior, but that's not the case. He actually starts with something that's very common to all of us. He starts in verse two by saying, I said of laughter, I said of comedy, I said of going home and turning on Netflix and decompressing by binge watching 16 episodes of something that would cause my heart to laugh a few times, even if it was a rerun, something that would cause my heart to have a little bit of joy because as I've gone throughout my day, I'm empty. My gas tank of joy is actually empty. So maybe I can find it through this, elect it's the scrolling through the YouTube and the fail videos and the buzz videos and the laughter of and the funny memes. I said of myself, come on, laughter. Laughter, laughter, not just laughter, but madness, like maddening laughter, like things that are ridiculously side splitting, kill over. I have to not hear it or look at it because I'm laughing so hard. I'm going, oh, laughter. You ever been there? Well, some of y'all are snorters. So for you, it's like, right? Is this sin? Is it, is it a sin to laugh? It's not a sin to laugh. It, it, it can be sin as to why we laugh. He says, what does it actually even accomplish? Attempting to grasp for joy in these momentary fleeting things that we would call laughter and or comedy. Matter of fact, for some, jokes are only a way to not deal with the hard questions of life. For some, and you know who they are in your life, need to make light of every heavy situation. Every deep or awkward time needs to be met with a joke or a sarcasm to lighten the mood. We love to have those people around us because they keep us from having to feel the hevel or the emptiness or the weight of life and heaviness of situations. 
There are some who serve others with comedy and some who are served with comedy, but both are on a pursuit of self. Matter of fact, psychologists are finding that some of the funniest people in the world are actually some of the most loneliness and disconnected people. We remember with the recent suicide of Robin Williams, one of my favorite comedians as a fan of comedy in the world. And yet there is stage Robin who is always on point. And then there is the personal life of Robin Williams that very few people knew, disconnected, lonely, depressed, always displaying comedy so he might find some meaning in life, but truly, even in laughter, it's, 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 it's fleeting, it's hevel. What are our hearts searching for? Well, to be delighted, to find escape, a taste of joy, like, like the wind coming and bringing satisfaction on our, on, our, on, our, on our hot, sweaty foreheads. It comes for a second. The breeze brings a refreshing coolness, but then it's gone. Maybe for you, it's not comedy. Maybe it's just the party for you. Maybe like verse three, he says, I searched in my heart how to gratify my flesh with wine while guiding my heart with wisdom and how to lay hold on folly till I might see what was good for the sons of man to do under heaven all the days of their lives. What is he saying here? He's saying literally in the Hebrew, the original language is like, I baptized myself in wine, which didn't mean that he made a pool full of wine and had somebody come and dunk him. It means that he was full of wine. Like he's like, I had wine to the fill. I utilized substances and I said, well, maybe the meaning of life is to be happy and maybe I need a substance to alter my brain because maybe, maybe it's a brokenness in me that can be fixed by a substance to bring me where I need to be. And, and for some of you, you're like, I, I, I get that, you know? Like, and maybe even for you, we had these glimpses of attempting to do that in our life. Like, like, like this guy is saying he was a wine connoisseur, you know? Like he's like, mm, yeah. <laughs> Like it's got, it's kind of got an oaky smell, you know. <laughs> and for some of you, like it could be a 1920 or it could come out of a box. It tastes like wine, you know. <laughs> for some of you, it might be a wine connoisseur thing. For some of you, it might be a, you know, 40 of OE in a paper bag kind of thing. <laughs> but no matter what, we're talking, what is he talking? He's talking about substances. Like most of you can say in here, I did the clubs. I did the pubs. I did the bars, and Jesus is just so much better. Amen. Some of you guys know what it's like to be in those situations and to be in the back room and to people watch and to say, this is meaningless. Well, there, there's some of us who just almost instinctively and naturally, like, like if I remember being in the world, I'd step into a party, and it was like, it was like cheers. Like Norm walks in, and everyone says, Norm, you know what I mean? Like for me, it was like, Josh Bass. I was like, what up? And then we give a bunch of hugs, right? And, and, it's kind of like Hosanna, but without the booze, right? So, so like here, I, you find yourself in this place, and it, what, what are you really looking for? Well, you're looking for community. You're hoping if I can find community, if I'm in community, maybe I could find happiness. And so we're trying to reproduce what God has designed for us to have as Christians, but in the world. We're trying to reproduce what God has for us without God. And so we create these environments and these parties. We're living for the Friday and living for the weekend and living for the moment to try to get a little in our life in, in hopes that maybe this time it would be as fun as it was. I remember two years ago, but, but, but it's like, it's like, a, it's like a, a wind that blows by and refreshes you for a second. You cannot contain that moment. It's the same with drugs. It's the same with trying to chase after that first high or that first moment when you felt it. And it's like, there is satisfaction, but you just can't get no satisfaction because the reality is the more that you search after it, the greater the void actually becomes. It's hevel. Medicating is a way to avoid life's hard questions. You might be here today and you say, you know, it's not the comedy. You know, I'm more serious than that. It's, it's not the substances. That's for losers. I'm not like the winos. I'm not like the addicts. I'm a functioning member of society. They should be too. You should, everybody should just get out and just be somebody and make something of themselves and make something for this world, find satisfaction through that. Well, guess what? He tries that too. I made 
my works great. I built myself houses and planted myself vineyards and I made myself gardens and orchards and I planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made myself water pools from which to water the growing trees of the ground. I acquired male and female servants. I had, like, I had people working with me, people working under me. I actually didn't even do any of this. I just, I was the boss and I created all of this and this whole kingdom. I was just like so proud and I had people that were following me. I was lo so loyal. I had even servants that birthed children in my house and stuck with me. They, they became my servants too. Yes, I had greater possessions. I had herds and flocks, which doesn't mean much to you, but like was a big deal in the writer's day, right? And then all who were in Jerusalem before me, I made it. My business was huge. I handled my business. And you have no idea how amazing it felt in that moment to follow after the monster that was building and creating and finding and establishing success in this world. Here's a question. Is the Bible against creating or progress? No. no, but it's the why. I'm not sure if you notice in this text, the I and me and myself, he repeated over and over again. It's, it's, it's not the progress, it's not the success, it's not the making something, it's not making something out of nothing, it's not making something out of yourself or out of your one little short life. That's not the problem. The problem is, was he into architecture or was he just building a monument? Was, was it something that he was creating for the glory of God or was it something that he was creating for the glory of himself? I built, I created, I had servants and employees. I had people under me and working under me. And this is what it led to in verse eight. I also had gathered for myself silver and gold. I had special treasures of kings, which who knows what that is? Special treasures of kings. I don't know, I'm not a king. I don't, but he had special treasures of some sort and of the provinces, and I acquired male and female singers, like entertainers, like to the delight of the sons of men, and I had musical instruments of all kinds. Like, like what he is saying here is, because I had built this, I had now had the fruit of building this, and I lived the life, wealth, and entertainment, and he's going to tell us a harem, which means sex, and all this, like this guy is straight Hollywood. When it came to money, it was endless. Treasures of kings. When it came to entertainment, I had my own personal singers and dancers, comedians, illusionists. I had a little petting zoo for the kids out back. Like, <laughs> people love, we'd come over, we'd party. My house was, it was, it was always on and popping. When it came to sex, I had a harem, right? I, any girl, color, age, size, mix, match, had the, like Solomon, we know through the Bible, actually tells he had 700 wives and 300 concubines. Like he had whatever his heart could, all the drink, all the money, all the status, all the wealth, all the pleasure, he had it, like, like he had it all. Matter of fact, he had it all so much so that the world was like, look at this guy. When it came to the headlines, Food and Wine magazine actually wrote that he was the greatest gourmand of his time. <laughs> Vanity Fair says that the most coveted excursion of the city is a private tour of his personal gardens. Like the Architectural Digest named him the designer of the year. Like when it came to the season finale of the lifestyles and the rich and famous, he was the season finale. You didn't need to pimp his ride, it stayed pimping. 20 inch rims in the chariot and everything. He had it all. He was the modern equivalent of Bill Gates and Tom Cruise and Hugh Hefner wrapped all into one. Matter of fact, he could even say of all that he did, I earned all of this with my own hands. He says in verse nine, so I became great. I excelled more than all who were before me in Jerusalem. And nobody, nobody even came close to me. Like he could literally write modern rap songs and they actually be true. <laughs> of how dope he was and how great he was, how fat his bank account was, how many girls he had. He just, he could write it all and all of it's true. Nobody even, nobody even came close or touched the life of the preacher. 
Also, even my wisdom remained with me. I just, I mean, I was just smart. I just knew how to run business, knew how to ma- handle and manage. I knew things other people just didn't even know. Like, like I was just was the smartest. I just, I lived it. Whatever my eyes even desired, I did not keep from them. I, I saw it, I wanted it, it's mine. I did not withhold anything from my heart. There was no pleasure that I withheld. Any pleasure, it, hedonism at its finest. For my heart rejoiced in all my labor. Like I found moments of happiness. I rejoiced. Like I look at all my labor and I'm like, look at all that I did. Look how phenomenal this is. Like truly the fulfillment of the gratification of of production and of your flesh can bring this benefit in our life of going, yeah, this is really awesome because it did for him. And this was my reward from all of my labor was having all of this. But it was at the nights in which he would sit up alone. He would head out to his balcony and he would survey all that his hands had built. He'd reach into his cabinet and pour himself another glass of brandy, light himself another Cuban. He'd look over his kingdom thinking, look at all that I have and look at all that I did. It was in those lonely moments I looked on all the works that my hands had done and on the labor in which I had toiled. And indeed, all was Hevel. It was all Hevel. It was all meaningless. It was all grasping for the wind. There was no profit. There was no real, real, real gain in life, even under the sun. Even though he had it all, he could not help to feel just as empty as when he started his journey. He says in Hebrew, Hebel, Reut, Rauch as pointless and as meaningless as grabbing the wind. I feel the effects and it's here and I reach out to grab the wind. I try to grab it and I try to bottle it to say, can I get that high back? Can I get that sexual experience back? Can I get the joy of building that thing? Can I get that that moment of of community and family and the the, the birthing of the children and the, the servants underneath me and all that? And I just can't grab it because there are moments that are here today and gone tomorrow and none of them seem to be consistent. None of them stay forever. Matter of fact, they just seem to make the void inside of me greater can anyone relate but yet we eat and we drink and we gamble and vacation and shop and game and sleep with and cheat on and spend on and build up and create and learn and google search and do the things in search of satisfaction that we just cannot find under the sun i mean imagine with me having every single thing your flesh desires at your disposal, anything you ever want to eat cooked for you by your private chef whenever you wanted, anticipating your needs, prepared. When it comes to food, foodies, he had it. When it came to substances, there was no better, clean, pure, as much as he wanted. When it came to sex and when it came to women, he had the finest, not in his land, but in all the lands, as he would, he would join into his harem wives and concubines of princesses and of daughters of kings from neighboring, like the most beautiful, given to him as gifts from kings and princes from all around, people searching and finding who is Jerusalem's next top model. And they would bring them, and it would be, it would be his. It would be his. He, 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 he had it. Wealth, he had it. Status, he had it. Nobody could surpass what the preacher had done with his life. And you think he would be satisfied. And to be honest, he says, I was able to actually look out at everything and rejoice over it. But for just a moment, because that moment I felt And then feelings fade and the substance is gone. Like holding water inside of your hands, you try to grasp it and there it goes. You have the fill of your flesh and you have a great time. 
and, and you think to yourself, yes, this is what life is. As a matter of fact, you could have a momentary pleasure. To, you, could, you could drive to Vegas today, drop a couple grand on an experience in Vegas, but by the morning you're gonna wake up and you will not have found ultimate satisfaction. They say what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Well, what you spend in Vegas stays in Vegas for sure. <laughs> but the emptiness carries over. The void becomes greater. Matter of fact, we live in a miniature Las Vegas. People come from all around the world to vacation in our valley. We create concerts. Matter of fact, we got Coachella this weekend. We build casinos and resorts and vacation areas for families or adults only, or no clothing only, <laughs> creating an experience for people to enjoy anything their hedonistic flesh would desire. Matter of fact, I once talked to a man who told me about what he would do in our city before he came to Jesus. He wrote this, I jotted it down. He said, quote, we would gather together to do any drug we wanted, drink anything we wanted, eat anything we wanted, and have sex with any one of each other that we wanted. And every one of us were open to do anything we wanted with each other. Money was no issue and no expense was spared, no desire withheld, and yet after it was all over, all I felt was emptiness, unquote. And the truth is, we all know this. When it comes to substances, the addict never gets to the place to say, ah, oh, there it is, the perfect high. I will never need to get high again. <laughs> not that, that's, that's not gonna be true because that high will fade and the, the need will become greater. It's the same with sex. You'll never get to the place to be like, perfectly satisfied, never need it again. It's an unquenchable thirst. The same thing with pornography. Matter of fact, what happens with porn is it just gets weirder. I've had people come to me and just say, Pastor, a naked girl is not enough for me. Now, I just, I'm into weird things. There's not enough food and not enough money and not enough success and not enough, pr the projects could be bigger. The contracts could be larger. The closing of the sales and the commissions could be fatter. So, what's up with that? What's up with man's constant hunger for pleasure? Let me help solve this for you. Everybody's saying, please. <laughs> well, we find actually in the Bible that the God of the Bible, he's a God of pleasure. Did you know that? A God is actually a God of pleasure. Matter of fact, he even finds pleasure himself. And that he created us, listen, to find pleasure as well. The Bible actually teaches us that, that, that in the beginning, God created. And in the creation of this world, he creates the heavens and he looks at them and with pleasure, he says, it's good. He creates the waters and the land. We know the story. And he, after he creates them, he looks at them. He surveys the land. And what does he say? It's what? He creates all the creatures and the sea and birds of the air and little insects even, weird insects. He, he likes them too. He just creates all that. And what does he say? It's good. I just like picture Jesus like, yo, dad, how's this like creation project going? He's like, it's all good. Like, it's all good. All of it, right? All of it's good. And then this is what he does in chapter two. He creates a garden. He, he just builds up all of these trees in the garden. This is what he does. He takes man, he forms man out of the dust of the earth, and he breathes into his nostrils, creates man in his image, which means if God enjoys, God creates, and God, 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 God has it in his attributes to enjoy creation and pleasure, then, 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 then he creates man in his image for us to do the same. And then he takes man and he sticks man in the garden. The garden is full of trees, the planting of orchards and projects, of aqueducts and navigating water, of tending to its own petting zoo, all the animals he's got can name them. He's got a job to do, he's got production. When it comes to food, he can eat anything he wants minus this one thing. 
When it comes to riches, the Bible tells us there were four rivers that flowed through the Garden of Eden that were teeming with riches like never, like, like, and Adam never seems to hoard those riches and begin to live for those riches or live for the trees or, or matter of fact, God, the only thing God says isn't good is for Adam to be alone. So God gives him a helpmate, just like, find satisfaction and the pleasure of you being united to a woman. And they were naked. They weren't ashamed. I'm sure they had lots of sex and just did what God called them to do. God commanded them, fill the earth, be fruitful, multiply. Got to have sex to do that. So I'm sure they did that. I'm sure they found their fill and all of these pleasing things. Not only that, but they had God. They were able to enjoy God in the midst of his own creation. God walked with them in the cool of the night. The Bible tells us that they had, a, they had this relationship with God in this sinless state that they were in the garden. But something happened in humanity's history. Most of you know what it is. There was a temptation, and as a result, there was a choice. That the one thing that they cannot have, no matter how much satisfaction they had, they're just like, they're just like the temptation to find satisfaction in just one other thing, something new, something forbidden, they take and they eat, and sin enters into humanity. And as a result, there's the removal of man from the garden. Insert sin. And along with sin, there's a factory in the human heart of every single one of us, every single human in this world. It's called an idol factory. Idols are anything that are created and worshipped in the place of God. It's the lowering of the creator and the elevation of creation. Things found under the sun are lifted up as if they deserve to be above the sun, as if they are the things to worship, as if they are the things to find satisfaction in, as if these things under the sun actually are life. And for thousands of years, man lived in rebellion against God, desperate to find enjoyment in the fulfilling of the things of this world, constantly trying to find the missing thing in their life. And so they move from the next thing to the next thing, hoping they could fill the emptiness they feel inside of their soul, not even knowing why they feel the emptiness in the first place. But we do. Because God has designed us to experience pleasure, beauty, enjoyment. We were designed to create and eat and enjoy. And it sounds like I have two conflicting messages, doesn't it? Well, I'll tell you because there is a balance in living a hedonist lifestyle and a legalist lifestyle. The hedonist says, I will give myself to do whatever in the world I want and enjoy all pleasures. While the legalist says, I won't be happy about anything. Anything that brings me any happiness or pleasure, I'm getting rid of it, man. Because I, I don't want, God hasn't designed us to be happy or pleased. And so you got a sourpuss look on your face and you're going in life. And you got, all of your, you got all of your commandments you wrote from yourself, right? Thou shalt not enjoy other humans. Thou shalt criticize everyone out of love. It's love. Thou shalt let people know how much holier you are than them. And, and we become, as legalists, the worst representation of Christianity and of God. And so where do we land? Indulgence of self-desire. That's selfish creating a list of rules so that we, we won't live after God's pursuits of pleasure and of joy and of happiness to show everybody how holy and righteous we are. That's selfish. See, the root cause is just the same. And then, and then here's the answer to everything. We have Jesus. We're designed to live life, listen to me, in a garden with God. Sin corrupted that. Because of sin, we're doomed to live apart from God in, in, in a thorny, fallen world. Always eating, but forever hungry. Always drinking, but forever thirsty. Always working, but forever feeling the need to busy ourselves. Always attaining possession, but always feeling the need to possess more. And it wasn't until another Adam came. The Bible talks about a second Adam or a last Adam. That first Adam is Adam. The word Adam means man. 
And then we see thousands of years of rebellion and idolatry and of hungering and thirsting and living and worshiping anything but God from a whole entire human race. God slips hand on his head going, come on, come on, it's me. Don't worship the creation, worship the creator. Don't worship the gifts, worship the giver, worship, worship God. He, here I am. And then all of a sudden, here comes Jesus. Jesus comes to earth and he, he lives this life of sinlessness that none of us could. Not only that, he lives this life of righteousness that none of us did, doing the right things out of a pure motive and heart to do the will of the Father, to love humanity. He loves God, loves others perfectly. And then we find this curious thing where all of a sudden Jesus, who's cruising through ministry for three and a half years, doing the same thing, loving God and others, all of a sudden, er, he finds a halt in a garden. It's called the Garden of Gethsemane. And it's in this garden where he stops and he kneels. And he says, he says, nevertheless, okay, okay, Father, I'm going to drink this cup of your wrath, and it's not going to be pleasurable. I won't be pleased with it, but you'll be pleased with it. And if you'll be pleased with it, then I want to be pleased with it. I want this cup to pass for me in my flesh. Nevertheless, I'm not going to be like Adam I'm going to be the new Adam. I'm going to be the last Adam. And I'm going to obey. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. The Bible says that God does all things according to the pleasure of his, according to the pleasure of his, his will. That's what pleases God is his will. So Jesus aligns his heart with God, the Father's heart, and says, I want to follow after your will. Nevertheless, not my will, your will be done. Be pleased. It won't be the pleasure of myself. It'll be the pleasure of following after you. Be pleased. And in that garden, he bows the knee and, and begins the process of heading to a thorny hill called Calvary. And he takes the thorns of this world for us. He takes our, our sin, our punishment. He takes our cross. He's buried. He rises from the grave. Why? So we can be restored to a garden with God again. Matter of fact, the book of Genesis, the first book of the Bible, starts with a garden. But the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, it ends with a garden. You guys are so smart. <laughs> Revelation chapter 22, there is the restoration of all things that were stolen from us through Satan and sin. Everything from Eden is restored in Revelation chapter 22. Everything that God had actually removed everything that sin had actually come in and corrupted, because of Jesus and his righteousness, because of him doing the will of the Father and not seeking after the pleasure of his flesh, he delivers unto us as his people again. We await for the day of a new garden. I wait for the day of, of no more tears, of no more darkness, of no more pain, of no more toil or thorns. Matter of fact, we find in the garden that there are trees, that there is a walking with God, that there's no darkness because Jesus himself is the light that just lights up the whole garden, that there is no evil that can get inside of it. There's no lies, no liars. There's, there's no heart broken sadness or pain. There's only healing. There's a tree in the midst of the garden that has these leaves that bring healing to all of the nations. It bears fruit in every single season. It's got a new fruit, which means we have change and newness to find new pleasure every single season. Amen. Every single season, there's a fruit. We, and so it's like this, this desire for newness is restored to us. Something new and something fresh and something to find pleasure in. God creates. The only thing is we don't elevate these creations above the creator. It's about him because in the midst of the garden, in the midst of heaven, there is Jesus with heaven's throne being worshiped, being glorified, taking his rightful place in his creation and in humanity, pleasure. We eat in heaven. Praise God. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. What a joy it is. So pleasure, pleasure. Here, here's what I want to tell you. Yes. Live for pleasure. That's my encouragement to you. But don't find that pleasure in hedonism. Don't find that pleasure in legalism. Yeah, when, when the hedonistic nature says, I'm just going to do whatever substance I want and sleep with whatever person I want and make as much as I want and just try to find, it's not there. 
Most of y'all already tried it. Some of y'all are young. You haven't been there yet. Let us tell you. It's not there. Yeah. It's, it's not there. Some of you guys are new to Jesus. We're just like so glad you're here, right? I just want to encourage you. It's not over here in legalism. Don't, you don't form a bunch of rules to make you right and better than anybody. The answer is right here. His name is Jesus. We fix our eyes on him. We find ultimate satisfaction in him. He's the ultimate source. He's the ultimate pleasure. He's the ultimate provider. No other thing will fill the void, the hole, the emptiness you feel in your soul. You got a hole in your soul, and only Jesus can take that place. And I hear the question of some. So Jesus has that place. Why do I still feel so unsatisfied? I just want to remind you of this time in your story and in your history. This time that we could define the chapter, if we were to title the chapter, it might be titled, Your First Love. You remember that season? Like, you, you tasted it all because, you know, you're, like you, you're in high school doing whatever you want, and then you're, like, college or maybe not college, or you're running the streets, or, you know, you were just, like, you just did whatever you want, and you were living that hedonistic lifestyle, and you're just, like, you're getting it done, man, and all of a sudden it just seems like the more that you do, the more that it just poured weight onto your shoulders, and you're walking through life all hunchy, and, like, I don't know why my life's miserable, right? I'm eating whatever I want. I'm drinking whatever I want. I'm smoking whatever I want. I'm sleeping with whatever and it's just making me all bent up. And you find this place of just like the heaviness of the world is too much. And then somehow, some way, you hear about Jesus. Somebody invites you or somebody tells you or you knew because when you were a kid or the television or the radio or you're alone at night or at a crusade or whatever your story is. And it's like on that moment, you remember that night, you like surrendered it all and you just like gave it all to Jesus. And it was like all of a sudden you were like, oh, I'm taking my first breath of life. I am... I have peace. I have this thing called joy. I, I, like, I have life that I didn't have before. And some of you guys are like, I remember that. Where did that moment go? And I'll tell you what that moment was. That moment was you realizing it's not about you living for yourself. It's about you living for the Savior. What happened in that moment was you took all of the hedonism of your lifestyle and you let Jesus take it off you and give to you his life. This is where it comes in for you Christians. Some of us forget the most simplest theological truth You get a lot of wisdom. You know a lot of things about the Bible. But you forget your first love. The church of Ephesus knew a bunch about Jesus. But they had forgotten about Jesus. And what is the simple truth? You cannot live for yourself and sin. You have to live for the Savior. It's so simple. Some of you guys are like, I swear I know that. But to know and to practically live are two different things. So if you're thirsting and you want to keep drinking salt water, go ahead, do you. <laughs> over here, over here is Jesus who makes it so simple. Whoever believes in me, whoever believes in me, won't thirst anymore. Out of him will flow rivers of living water. You're just gonna quench, I'm gonna quench your thirst. And it's like, I know that. Because 17 years ago, 27 years ago, three years ago, I gave my life to Jesus. I experienced the satisfaction of Jesus. And then I somehow lost it. You didn't lose it, you left it. And what you left was the well. And the well, his name is Jesus. 
and he is willing to pour you a drink. You can stand up on your balcony with all that you've produced in this world and swirl your little wine around and say, I just look at all I've attained. But the truth is, if you shut off the comedy and you put away the substances and you take away the projects and, the, and all, the, all the Hollywood and you just, you, you just sit alone at night, you're going to say, gosh, how did I get tricked that all of this was vanity? And let me just answer to you. Because you got a nature like your daddy, Adam. He got tricked. We get tricked. It's the only one who didn't get tricked. He said, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And he paved a path for us. So what do you need to do? You need to say, nevertheless, I just want your will. And here's the thing about God. His will is not just horrible things. His will is so many amazing things, it's ridiculous. But he's got to be there. He's got to be the one that you put in the center. So stop your rules, okay? Because your rules ain't helping you, they ain't helping nobody. Okay? Stop your rules. Stop just saying, forget this. I'm going to live for myself. Listen, do the, do the one thing we all know we need to do, and that's just make Jesus, make Jesus everything. So here we are, Lord. Jagger can't get no satisfaction. We can't. Because we haven't got you, Jesus. But we want you. Most of us in this room, we have you, Jesus. You're the center point of our salvation and of our life, Lord. And for some of us in this room, we'd say, you once were the center point and the focus of my life. Some can totally relate, God. Here we are. We're just on the treadmill of life like Dustin was so beautifully showing us. We're walking, we're walking, and we're gaining, but it's not enough to make us whole. Only you can make us whole. God, forgive us for our pursuits. Forgive us, God, for like the woman at the well, we have had five husbands and the one that we're with now is not our husband and we're thirsting. And if we just ask you for water, Jesus, you would give us water that would cause us to never thirst again. Lord, help us to have her faith. Help us to have her encounter. Will you show up? Jesus, you promised us where two or three are gathered in your name, you will be here in our midst. You're greater than Elijah. But Elijah was able to call down fire from heaven to consume our idols. We're calling upon you, Jesus, to come and to burn away the things that are not of you, the things that do not satisfy, the things that do not ratify the desires that are in our flesh. Here we are, God. I'm praying as your church that you'd help us to not leave this moment today, but to get it, to get it, God. As we head into worship, Lord, I just pray that your Holy Spirit would do something special in our hearts, that you would move in our midst, God, that you would display gladness and joy for some of us again. Some of us, it's been a long time since we've sensed the benefits of being at the well. Some of us, the Holy Spirit has already told us you've left your first love and we want to come back to it again. And it's because we've given our heart's affections away to the things that are under the sun. And here we are looking above the sun with hands reaching up saying, Lord, you are worthy. You are worthy to love, to live for, and to give all to Holy Spirit, will you have this moment and stir our hearts. And church, I want to encourage you to make this a private time with you and God. And as we worship, let the Holy Spirit wash over you. Maybe it's a simple prayer to say, Jesus, I'm back at the well. I want to drink of you. I want to believe what you've said. I want to love you with all I all I have, like I once first did. Maybe God has already pointed out the things of this world that have distracted you or that have stolen away. Maybe he's pointed out your 
fruit and the deception and the lie. God's good to expose that, isn't he, church? Let him expose. But don't just let him expose. Don't leave here guilty. Let him take you to the cross. There's another tree. The first tree brought a curse. But the second tree, the tree of Calvary, the cross, took our curse. For cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Jesus took our curse on that tree. Let him take you to the tree. Let him take you back to that place to where you first loved, to where you first let go, to where you first surrendered it all. I remember the moment that I stood before the Lord. I remember that moment inside that youth room as a 19-year-old. I said, what, do you, what if you know to do right? Think you know about Jesus, but you just wanna, you just wanna keep doing wrong. You just wanna keep sinning. If you believe in Jesus, can you, can you still go to heaven even though you do whatever you want? That's what I asked the preacher. And the preacher looked at me and said, Josh, you know what you need to do. And I did. I needed to give Jesus the rightful place of rulership over my heart. God, take me to that place. God, take us to that place. Take us to the tree that brings life.